All right, guys. It's Monday. Um, I'm on a cruise. So, you're on your own, suckers. No, actually, I'm, I'm very sad to be away from the classroom. Um, I really enjoy this unit. And um, luckily, the next few days are not going to be so bad. So, hopefully, uh, the layout of these videos is going to be helpful. Uh, feel free to pause at any point or rewind or um, fast forward if you if you get bored, I guess. I don't know. I just try to stay awake uh, to the to the screen. And um, I watched a lot of Khan Academy. I'm hoping to do a little imitating of the great Khan man himself. Ha ha. But uh, no promises there because I can't repeat everything I say a hundred times. Sorry, I tried it. Just it's not working for me. But that's okay. So um, enough rambling. Uh, you're gonna want to take notes, right? Um, and each each day you'll have maybe 15 minutes of me on this nice little uh, recording, and then you'll have plenty of time to work together and, and try to solve problems and, and make math happen. So uh, what we're going to start with today is called the antiderivative. Dun, dun, dun. Um, it sounds like kind of ominous and, and, and daunting, but it's it's really just working backwards is what it is. It's it's like what you've done the last month in calculus. Oh wait, now we're going to work backwards. So um, you know, graphically, I guess what I'm saying graphically is that if um, you know, if I gave you a quadratic, okay, so well, this is kind of normal derivative type stuff here. If I gave you a quadratic and said to do the derivative of that, then um, you would be finding, you know, some kind of uh, linear function um, that would go along with it. So um, a quadratic, x squared, sort of maps to, to a linear, um, and actually x squared wouldn't map to x, but I guess it would map to 2x because that's its derivative. So now we're going to go the opposite way, right? So I would ask you, you know, hey, here's a here's a, a line. And I would say, given some line that has some slope, uh, what is its antiderivative? So when you hear that word, it really does mean, you know, work backwards and, and try to think about if this is the, the derivative, what problem or equation did it actually come from? So if you see something linear, you probably would assume it's some type of quadratic, but we need to talk about how to know exactly which quadratic it came from um, based on the slope of this. And, and then, of course, we'll apply it to all sorts of things, okay? So, um, so from an equation standpoint, um, what I'm asking here is um, from an equation, it would be like me giving you the answer to the derivative and you having to fill in the rest, okay? So it, it might be me like saying, hey guys, um, I want you to figure out what was behind the derivative that gave me an answer of x. So it's whose derivative is x. And, and this is what taking an antiderivative really is, is trying to reason through this. Um, you might think, oh, well, there's an x there, so it probably came from some form of x squared. Um, but it's kind of confusing because then you're like, but wait a second, it's not x squared. Because if I put x squared in here and I took the derivative of that, then what happened to the 2? So you got to kind of reason through that and go, well, wait a second. Okay, so if I move the 2 to the front, but then that 2 has to disappear then maybe I could multiply by one half or maybe this was over two to begin with so that when I brought that to the front and then it reduced it would turn out nicely. Um, maybe you're thinking that, maybe you're not. Um, but that's, that's what you have to do. You have to reason it out and try to figure out where did everything go. So, um, so based on that, you know, try to take a guess for something like this, like what might go behind this derivative that would have an answer of x cubed. So take a minute and think about that. What would have been here that would give me x cubed as my derivative? Okay, once again, you might be thinking, well, that's a cube, so it probably came from some kind of fourth degree problem because I would have had to subtract one, but there's no coefficient in the front. So, like, what could have gone in the front to cancel it? 
Oh, uh, well, maybe a one-fourth. Or you could either write a one-fourth here, or you could put the function over four. Either way, it's the same thing. And we could sort of play this game all day long. But um, now we sort of have a model for working backwards. Okay, We have a rule. Um, and you could think of it as a almost like a backwards power rule. Backwards power rule. Um, for finding the antiderivative. Um, and so we might write some, or, or write it like this, maybe um, the antiderivative for x to the n is the following. Okay, well, let's think about this. Uh, what did we, in both cases, what did we have to do? Well, we took what we were, the answer, and we, we first had to add one to the exponent. So for sure we had to do um, the base and then we, we added one to the exponent. But then to account for the coefficient being missing or going away, we then sort of divided by that same number. So not by n, but by the n plus 1. So that is sort of your backwards power rule or your um, answer for how to do an antiderivative. Now antiderivative, uh, I may say another word in lieu of that. Um, some people call it an integral. So if you've heard people talk about um, integrals or integrands um, at any point in your life, they were talking about taking an antiderivative. So the first half of calculus, or AB calculus, the first half of AB calculus is derivatives. The second half is integrals. So everything we've been doing forward, we're now going to begin doing backwards. Yay! And that's only going to get trippy when we bring in the trig. That's when my mind kind of goes crazy and a little weird. But, um, but for the power rule, it's not too bad. Uh, okay, so now before we do any more practice problems of, of this backwards power rule, let's talk notation, okay? Um, because I don't want to have to write the word integral or antiderivative every time I do it. So... Um, so the way that this works is, you know, for derivatives, we write it like this. So we have this d over dx, and then there's like a function behind it, and then we get our answer, okay? Now for antiderivatives, there is a symbol, and that symbol looks something like that. And I'm sure you've seen that actually quite a bit on those math funny t-shirts and online and stuff and you may just not have known what it meant. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's taking a, der it's, it's a backwards uh, derivative. So um, this is called an integrand. So you'll have this symbol followed by the function, uh, whatever that function is, and then you need this dx notation. So the dx doesn't go away, right? It's, it's, it's still in this problem and the reason we need this is the same reason that we need it over here with respect to x. So now instead of taking a derivative with respect to x, we're taking an antiderivative with respect to x. And so that is, is very much needed back there. Um, so that's what you're, that's what you're going to see. Um, and this antiderivative or this integral, when written like this, has yet another name. Um, it's referred to as an indefinite, indefinite integral. And the word indefinite uh, probably raises some questions like, why are they calling it indefinite? I mean, can't we get a definite answer? Well, actually, no, because, you know, what would you say if I, if I told you there was an actual, an infinite amount of answers uh, to the following problem? If I just threw this at you, hey, what's the integral of x uh, dx? Um, there's actually an, an infinite amount of answers. Uh, the first answer that, that you might come up with uh, is just what we said before. You might say, but Ms. Mink, you know, you just said a second ago that the antiderivative was um, one half x squared or x squared over two, however you guys want to write that. Um, and, you know, you, you might be right, but what if I told you that, no, I think that another answer for this problem might be one half x squared plus two, or uh, maybe one half x squared minus three, or I'm tired of this. Okay, we could play that game, but um, do you see where I'm kind of going with this? Um, there could be an infinite amount of constants written back here, uh, plus, 
positives or negatives because when you take a derivative of those, you know, work backwards now, when you take derivative of those, that would go away. And that's why there's no constant behind that. So um, whenever you take an indefinite integral, it is good form to write a, a arbitrary value in this spot uh, to let your reader know that there could be a constant back there and we just don't know what it is, okay? So the notation that I'd like for you to box um, is this right here. Uh, the integral of f of x equals dx um, is equal to, okay, we're going to actually write like how I want your answer written. Um, the, the math world often writes a capital F to denote integration, okay? So this is saying we've taken an antiderivative, f of x, capital F of x, and then plus c. So plus c is going to be the magic value that you write back there to tell your reader that, hey, there's a constant. We just don't know what it is, all right? And uh, and that's, that's how that works, okay? Um, okay, so let's do an example or two or 20. Uh, la, 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 next page. How about this? Um, let's see if y'all can do the integral of 2x to the third dx. I want to see what you might do for something like this, okay? <clears throat> Don't let the two throw you. Really just focus on the x cubed. Think about what you would do with that part. And some of you might be wondering, you know, well, is it, is it the same as derivatives where if there's a constant multiple, we can just kind of ignore it and then put it back on later? Um, and the answer is yes. Yeah, you can. Okay, so just like with the derivative, you can almost think of that too as not being a part of the problem uh, because it is just multiplied here. Um, so it's a constant multiple rule where you can pull that 2 out and then just integrate that part. Okay, so we're going to have 2 times... Um, Working backwards here, the backwards power rule, we add 1 to the exponent, x over 4, and then put it over that new exponent of 4, okay? x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, okay? And then don't forget your plus c. Now, this is ugly and easy to clean up, so in a case like this, please clean it up, guys. So we're just going to call that x to the 4th. That would become a 1 half, and then plus c. So that's your final answer. Okay, so that's the antiderivative. If you want to check yourself, okay, if you wanted to check, you could just take a derivative of this and make sure that you got that. Okay, so take your normal derivative and there it is. Boom, you know you did it right. Okay, so feel free to check yourself. All right, next problem. What if I gave you 1 half x to the second minus 4x to the sixth dx? Yeah. All that is behind the integral symbol, so we need to anti, take the antiderivative of everything. And um, once again, you might be worried about, is it legal to split this up? Um, and the answer is yes, just like derivatives, you can split this up. So take the integral of this one minus the integral of this one. Um, and that only is true because it's a plus or a minus, okay? So if it was, sub, um, sorry, multiply or divide, uh, that ain't going to fly. But add or subtract, totally legal. And do what you would normally do. So add 1 to this. Put it over 3. Times by that 1 half, that constant multiple, minus. Same thing, add 1 to this. Put it over that 7. And then you've still got a 4 chilling in the front. I'm just going to move it on the numerator here. So, uh plus c, okay? Uh, don't forget that plus c, please. Um, you can go ahead and combine those if you like. Um, so we could just call this x to the third over 6 minus 4x to the 7 over 7 plus c. I'm not going to get a common denominator on those, but no, I'm just not. I don't think you need to worry about it either, honestly. Um, look at the answers in the back of the book today, and then, you know, if I'm a liar, then I guess go ahead and try to do common denominators, but I really don't think you'll need to, just because you got that weird C chill in there, and you don't want to have to mess with that. So, so that's a perfectly acceptable answer. Okay. 
All right, so let me give you a couple more that are a little less obvious. For some of you, this is already obvious and pretty easy to figure out, uh, but we may come across some. Okay, this is a pain in my butt. All right, I'm going to... Ah, bright, bright light. Okay, we're on a white screen. Yay, that means it must be serious. We're on a white screen. Okay, so uh, let's try something funkier. How about this? Ooh, I like this. Oh, my gosh. Okay, don't freak out on me, right? Um, I know it's a fraction, and your power rule doesn't cover fractions, but guess what? You can rewrite it just like you did with derivatives. So really think of that as x to the negative third, and from there take a derivative. Just be careful, okay? Um, we're going to do add 1 to negative 3, and you actually get negative 2 when you add 1 to this. And then we're going to put that negative 2 in the denominator as well. So I'm going to final answer, negative 1 half, oops, or negative 1 over 2x squared, I guess, and then plus c. Awesome. Next, I'm going to shut up and let you try it first. You got 30 seconds. Give it a shot. All right, time's up. The rewrite should have been next to the one half. And then from there, same rule, add 1 to the exponent, so it's now 3 halves, and then put it over that 3 halves. Now, that is the same thing, folks, as just 2 thirds times x to the 3 halves. So get in the habit of, of getting that fraction out of the denominator and, and just writing it like that. Oh, plus c, don't forget the plus c. Okay, um, and even if you're given something that's a little more complex, or it looks like it's going to be complex, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, we don't have a product rule. I don't know what to do. Okay, yes, you do. It's called distributing. Ooh, distribute. Just distribute it first. And I'm actually not even going to finish this. Just distribute, and then distribute. Uh, then go. Okay? All right. Um, if you're feeling good, this is an awesome one. If you're feeling good, how about two sine x dx. Hmm. <laughs> well, some of you have already got it figured out and you can easily do this. Some of you don't even know where to start and some of you are going to miss a negative sign. So here's what my brain does. I do not memorize the trigonometric antiderivatives. I just know the derivatives so well that I can work backwards. So when I see this, my mind does this. My mind says, all right, Mink, you know that the derivative of cosine goes to negative sine, and you know that the derivative of sine goes to positive cosine. So I just work backwards. So instead of reading the table this way in my brain, my brain goes, we're doing an antiderivative, so I'm thinking about this, and I'm saying, okay, so if I'm starting with this, then when I work backwards, it's cosine, but what about that negative? I guess it better go with it, you know? we got to account for that negative. So I know that the answer to this is going to be the constant multiple of 2, and then the integral of sine is going to be a negative cosine. Let's see. Okay? So if you write down or look at all of your um, derivatives for trig, then uh, it's going to work backwards where, you know, if I told you, hey, what's the integral of a uh, secant squared? That's a terrible, terrible integral. Yeah, sorry, that's just embarrassing. Okay, um, that's better. If I gave you a secant squared back here, then you most certainly can go, oh, oh, I know that secant squared is the derivative of tangent. So what that means is you should be excited to see this behind the integrand because you know that it comes from tangent. We're just working backwards here. So that's all you have to do, tan x plus c. All right, very good. So um, there are so many 
so many properties and so many flashcards that can now be made for your integrals um, if you choose to make these flashcards. And I would say take time in class today now. Uh, you may as well take some time in class if you've got flashcards with you. Um, I also would like for you, um, sorry, page 250. 250. That's the magic page in the book that has like all these great, uh, it's got a huge box full of great formulas. So half of them you've already written down because you've known the derivatives. So now you'll write down the other half because they're the antiderivatives. And um, I also need you to read page 253. Um, before you attempt the assignment today, you have to read this. Like, you have to or you won't be able to do some of the problems. Because I didn't cover every little thing. I just covered 90% of every little thing. So read that, then you'll be able to attempt these problems. I know it looks like a lot. And honestly, that's because um, it is. But I, you need the practice, I promise. You need the practice to get in this mode of, of thinking backwards. And also, you know what? Uh, you got time, people. Uh, my guess is right about now. It's still about 15 minutes until the, the bell rings. And then you have the whole second period to do it, okay? What am I writing? 55, 57, 77. Oh, stop, Miss Snake. Okay, there you go. So there, that is a beautiful assignment. Beautiful. You should be able to finish almost all of it, though, honestly. By the time you read this, make a few flashcards, you'll finish almost all that in class. And uh, I might give you a few minutes in class tomorrow. Uh, and I say I, um, Ms. Robinson, might give you a few minutes in class tomorrow, 10 or 15, but no more than 10 or 15. Um, and also, speaking of her, she's awesome. Don't abuse her. I will hurt you. All right, y'all have a great day.